lecture uh, from Professor Anton Delat concerning the neurophysiology of our facial pain and the fantastic journey from dental occlusion to this orofacial pain era. We are now here to get back to the basis. And the basis in our field is knowing the anatomy and the stomatognitic physiology. Uh, we have already discussed earlier this morning in this summer camp of the Italian study group of carnal mandibular disorders about the index of contents of uh, this morning lecture. And by the way, always remember that the index of contents for a lecture is your uh, uh, card. You have always to present something concrete to the audience. And today we are going to start with the anatomy. You all know that the, uh, I guess you all know that the anatomy of the temporal mandibular joint is pretty unique in the human body. Uh, I guess there is no need to, to, to repeat that we got a condyle a large into a fossa of the temporal bone. The structures, if we cut a slice uh, in a carotid specimen, look like that. Uh, before commenting on the single uh, structures, it is important for you to understand that these slices that we are commonly used to see in every presentation, in every book, actually are not parallel to the uh, uh, medial sagittal plane because they are oriented obliquely because the condyles are obliquely oriented in a, a mediolateral direction. So this means that if this is my left condyle, for example, this slice is projected on a paper like that, but it cuts me like that, okay? So it is not a, a negligible thing to consider when we are going to interpret in imaging and how to the mandible, how the mandible moves and all these uh, neatological issues. The components of the temporal mandibular joint. Number one is the temporal mandibular joint disc. Disc is, from a sagittal uh, view, made of three zones. Uh, there is a posterior band, which is the thickest one. It is two and a half to three millimeters uh, uh, in thickness. And then there is a biconcave shape with a thin intermediate zone and a more thicker anterior band. The disc is a fibrocartilaginous structure. And it means that, uh, uh, of course, it, may, it is made by a combination of fibrous and uh, some cartilaginous uh, uh, fibers, but you should know that the fibrous component is much more important than the cartilaginous component <coughs> in a healthy disc. We'll see later the historical videos of uh, uh, Professor Vestenson showing, uh, of course, in an autopsy specimen with all the limitations you can imagine, that the disc basically adapt like a cushion on the uh, temporal mandibular joint condyle. This means that uh, uh, the cartilaginous component becomes more and more important uh, with the degradation of the disc. So when you have a uh, normally position this, which means uh, uh, you got an articulation working in a well-balanced way, the disc is fibrous. When you start to have uh, um, positional changes, which are signs of degradation uh, within the temporomandibular joint, the cartilaginous component of the disc becomes thicker and it is responsible of the joint sounds because otherwise a cushion uh, can uh, uh, produce
du sein. And it is also an explanation of why sometimes we got uh, MRI images with an anteriorized disposition without a clinical sound and vice versa. The correlation is around 80% between the anteriorized disposition and the, the, the clinical sound. So we got the posterior band, the interrogated band, and the arterial band. In what is considered a physiological disposition, the posterior band, posterior band is located around mid -noon with respect to the apex of the temporomandibular condyle. So, uh, when you are going to see MRIs of patients with the disc uh, uh, having the posterior band located like that in this position, uh, the diagnosis will be this displacement or better, Anton, I don't know if you agree with me, anteriorized disposition. Because the word displacement uh, carries uh, uh, with itself the, 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 a connotation of disease, exactly. Exactly. Which is actually uh, uh, not what we want to, to, to convey as a message, because it is strange. We, 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 we are saying that uh, uh, that condition is not an indicator of pathology, that it should not be treated, and we call it displacement. Yeah. So we are making the same error that all these neonatologists do when they call dysfunction uh, a sign uh, of uh, imperfect movement on the sagittal plane or uh, an animal that moves slightly uh, slower than the ideal, okay? So, uh, the prefix this, which means uh, uh, something wrong, okay? It has a negative connotation. In my mind, should be used more carefully, especially in the future classification. And this kind of uh, proposals have been already, has been already made by several people over uh, the years and uh, I've been personally uh, surprised by the fact that in the new DC TMD it hasn't been uh, uh, considered. Uh, but I'm sure that in the future uh, we are going to, to, to move forward also in this field. Uh, I'm not saying that having a displaced disc is normal. Okay? Because again, Mother Nature has designed our body to have a disc more or less here. What we actually don't know yet is how far is acceptable from this position the biological variation. And confounding factors, let, let, let me call uh, uh, age, confounding factors like age or uh, other issues are of course entering the arena and if you say uh, if you see uh, displaced this at the age of 50 I guess it may be considered a sign of yeah. uh, becoming Asian. older Asian. 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 Yeah. exactly of course if you see displaced this at the age of 16 should be considered a sign of imbalance between the forces the joint uh, uh, can bear and the forces the joint uh, is transmitted. But the real problem is that are we really able to modify the position of the disc, to modify the, 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 the anatomy of the skeleton just to uh, arrange the disc to an ideal position? The answer is no. The answer is no. And as Anton yesterday told us, there are many, many uh, publications, but also clinical experience from all the, the, the top researchers in the field 
saying that in the end, adaptation will occur. As soon as you are able to, to uh, let me say, reduce the load on the joint, and the only way to reduce the load on the joint is to reduce the oral parafunction uh, tip. It is not uh, by working on the tip that you can reduce the load, the load uh, on the joint. If you're able to reduce the load on the joint, uh, adaptation of course. And you see the very same patient with a small condyle, a dual bite with large overjet at the age of 15, clipping joints, some pain because they're youngsters, adolescent, stressed by the examination, the, the parents and so on. They see those people at the age of 30 or 28 with, for example, mushroom-like condyles adapting to this uh, 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 forced remodeling without any symptoms. So, I guess we should start thinking, as in the field of praxis, uh, about biological variation. For years, we have treated and we have even diagnosed uh, uh, imaginary disease. So, now we know enough, according to my feeling, uh, to try to rewrite our topics and to start really thinking, also in terms of classification, about what is really uh, uh, treatable or need to be treated because all the other or many other uh, uh, professional fields in the medical uh, areas are moving into that direction. Okay? Otherwise, the other option is to stay stick with ontology. I see much ontology in this current, this displacement with reduction uh, 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 terminology and definition. Because it is a perfect description of the position of the disc. But the clinical correlates in terms of treatment demanding condition are yet to be defined. Of course, as a sign of age and further stages of, uh, uh, of the condition, over the age, the disc moves forward and forward, okay? So, the disc displacement with reduction at the age of 20, independently of the condylar remodeling, it is really likely to be a disc displacement without reduction at the age of 50. But what it is uh, incorrect with respect to the previous view of the situation, is that in between, there's almost never a closed lock. Do you agree, Anthony? So it means that uh, the closed lock and all these uh, dysfunctions uh, in terms of patient symptoms or um, malfunctioning uh, of the system are more related with the behaviors of the muscle then with the single issue of the disposition. It's interaction. It's interaction. Yeah, it's interaction. Yesterday I, I was joking when I, uh, I was saying to, to, uh, <coughs> to Eva, uh, how is it possible that uh, you have been told the muscles and the joint? When I see there's an oral appliance for the muscles and another appliance for, for the joint, <laughs> I become crazy. It is a nonsense from a biological viewpoint. Because the only thing you can do is to temporarily change the way the joints are loaded and the way the muscles are, uh, uh, are working. Okay? And the pathogenesis of the phenomenon, pain, which is the reason why patients come to our office, is not different if you have pain on the right joint or on the left joint and if you have pain also on the 
origin of the masters and on the uh, pterygoid or only on the pterygoid or uh, on the contralateral master. The pathogenesis is an overload. It is an imbalance between load and tolerability of the load. And this very simple pathogenesis, as we have been uh, told yesterday, has nothing to do with chronic pain. Chronic pain is another issue. Chronic or fascia pain is the, 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 the broken will. But the true temporomandibular disorders are simply a sign of overload. That, of course, uh, in terms of uh, symptoms onset, are influenced by the, the features of the anatomy. If you got a very tough mandible with well-trained muscles, of course, uh, uh, you're able to bear much more load with respect to those very small mandibles with one centimeter over jack and, and very fragile condyle. And it is not by chance that you see the early click in the adolescence, the early pain in the uh, age of 18 or 20, in those mostly female individuals uh, uh, with larger jack and <coughs> uh, uh, or hyperdivergent facial morphology. But there's nothing you can do. I'm disturbed when I uh, listen to something contrary. There's nothing you can do. That's mother nature. If you're born with a one centimeter of a jet and a small mandible, I'm sorry for you. I will be with you along the path of your life to try to teach you uh, to not to overload your mandible. But I'm one meter eighty, so I'm pretty tall for Italian standard. I would love to uh, become a basketball player and do what Russian Black Westbrook does. Dunking 360 degrees. Uh, I cannot do it. Mother Nature uh, uh, made me 180. So we should stop applying the concept of ideality which permeates dentistry to the field of TMD pain. And it is not because patients, uh, uh, of course, ask us for the resolution that we are obliged to promise them a resolution. Because if you are born to uh, uh, not being a basketball player, you cannot be a basketball player. But you can train and have a good health. So if you are born to have a, a low tolerability mandible, you should be trained to use that mandible safely. Okay? So it is not by chance that you see all those... Uh, think about uh, uh, all the um, teenagers coming to your office with a clicking mandible, uh, we'll see someone maybe even uh, today's afternoon or tomorrow afternoon for sure, okay? All those late teenagers coming to your office uh, uh, with a clicking joint or even with a, a locked uh, joint. In my experience, most of them are super stressed in the sense they are over uh, oppressed, stimulated. stimulated by the parents, yeah. or, or or they are perfectionists in nature. They 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 are all super good at school, and that's why I'm happy uh, about my my kid because uh, he's a genius in math, but he also has a girlfriend. He plays tennis. Okay, uh, he he can manage his geniality. 
Okay? Uh, they are all having these kind of features. And our way of action should be different with respect to our normal technical procedures that are 99% of what we do as endodontists, prosthodontists, orthodontists, or restorative dentists. Okay? Is it clear? So, the condyle, we cannot uh, uh, change or modify the shape and the, 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 the dimension of the condyle, the size. The condyle is genetically determined. And it is a bone covered by a thick, uh, a thin, sorry, layer of fibrocartilage. And thinking about the joint uh, uh, areas covered by cartilage, we will see this concept later this morning, is important to understand how the joint is designed to be low. The direction of the, of the load is like that. It is not like that. Chuck Green gave us a wonderful lecture at the uh, GSID Congress suggesting us, suggesting, confirming the concept that we are not dealing with a ball in a socket, but we are dealing with a ball on a hill. Or a wagon on a downhill. Be poets. <laughs> Do, de de define define it uh, uh, however you want. But the concept is that we don't have a hammer and, and a ground. Okay? So, terminologically, we got the product, the mandibular surface of the product, we got the bone marrow. Bone marrow can become uh, really uh, um, stressed in terms of low perfusion. Sometimes you can have a high level of effusion within the bone marrow. And then there's the temporal surface of the temporal mandibular joint, which is also cover in this area until here, basically along the articular eminence, which is loaded by cartilage. Cartilage is not here. The bone here, separating the temporal mandibular joint from the uh, um, the, the, the medial cranial fossa, is really symptom. So there's no cartilage, and we got a very subtle uh, bone to separate our joint from the brain areas. So how could it be biologically plausible that the position of the condyle is uh, something uh, uh, rare most in the glenoid fossa. If the anatomy is designed to work this way. Okay? So all those theories concerning the need to register the hinge axis that in theory it may exist for the very first few millimeters of movement when you force the condyle in the uh, rearmost position in the condyle. A nonsense from a biological viewpoint. And as a, a general practitioner who performs prosthodontics, I, I'm an active member of the Italian Prosthodontic Society. Okay? And I see many, many colleagues working with all those theories of mandible positioning and finding the hinge axis to recruit the mandible that they are still wondering why, after their restoration, they got the posterior open bite. Oh, if you knew the anatomy, you 
should understand that you force the mandible into a non-natural position. And Mother Nature, sooner or later, wants the mandible to come back to the natural position. And it's not Manfredini or the literature or the lab who says that. It is Mother Nature. And you are pretending to, 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 to uh, make anatomy with an instrument. To redesign anatomy, functional anatomy. Okay. There's the retrodiscal area, which is where the vessels and nerves are located. So from a didactical viewpoint, I must say that pain origins from here or from the synovia, which is uh, uh, split into by the disc, the posterior, posterior uh, inferior joint compartment and the anterior superior joint compartment. So we got blood vessels, we got uh, uh, inflammatory uh, soup entering the synovia, and we got pain. And then we got here the nerves transmitting and modulating the message to the brain stem. And it is nice. Another thing, when I listen to people, uh, uh, even neurologists, uh, calling TNJ pain as a trigeminal pain, of course, all the uh, uh, main sensitive nerves of the face origin from, from, uh, from the trigeminal. So the differential diagnosis is very uh, important, but again, you should know the anatomy. This is how the TMJ works. I guess you, you have seen this kind of video on YouTube. Okay? So this is in theory a normal joint. In theory, in the sense that uh, it may happen that this patient has pain. Sorry. So you got the close mouth position. The, the, the condyle move forward and the disc rotates with respect to the condyle. So we got the component of uh, this rotation with respect to the condyle because in the open mouth position, th this is not yet open mouth position, uh, I, I phrased the image uh, some degrees earlier, but anyway, you are seeing that the intermediate zone is designed so uh, uh, thin just to be positioned in between the uh, condyle and the articular eminence in the open mouth position. Okay, again, modern nature. These are the uh, retrodiscal issues, and of course, this is the virtual TMJ cavity that becomes real cavity in the open mouth position. That's why we are going to see, for instance, joint lavage, arthrosynthesis, uh, uh, with the pump theory ideated by Dr. Guarda, uh, injecting the fluid in the open mouth position, and then the, the fluid gets out in the closed mouth position uh, as an effect of the concentration of, of the pump effect. Okay? And what you can see from this image, from this very short video, is that the disc, as I told you before, is pretty adaptable to the condyle. So um, it is not a very uh, tough, very cartilaginous uh, structure. Okay. 
we test more and more cartilaginous when we age and function and uh, external factors it became uh, overloaded or simply it became used so if I take this disc with the form uh, uh, shape of course it is much more predominantly cartilaginous than fibrous with respect to the, the disc we, we have seen before okay but is it a really alter a dysfunctional anatomy we should the, the, the safest answer is that we don't know because we have to correlate all the clinical and imaging and anatomical features to really understand what it is important for the patients okay try to perform some sort of personal uh, uh, autopsy to have our own specimen. Believe me, it is really difficult. And what I've learned from this experience together with Professor Ferdinando Paternostro of the University of Florence in Italy, Anton, I don't know if you agree with me, is that uh, most of the uh, autopsy specimen we seen is are more or less artifacts because they are really difficult to 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 create uh, the, the mandible moves in your hand because in the end it's not like sectioning a stable bone and to see uh, uh, what's behind the surface an autopsy of the temporal mandibular joint requires to do something like that and when you cut everything away of course you can uh, uh, do good pictures and you can have uh, all the textbook like images you want but it is not really easy to understand issues like the insertion of the pterygoid, the form of the temporal mandibular joint disc or even where the disc finishes and starts the capsule or the ligaments or, or the, the, the muscle. So there's a lot of speculations on these issues and the reason is that it is really difficult to, to have a very, very good specimen. So, uh, uh, just to give you an example, this is an image, this is the disc, this is the muscle. And what I love to say is that anatomy should be preferred to be learned in real life. And anatomy in real life comes from our TMJ surgery experience. TMJ surgery experience has been fundamental together with the teachings of Luca Guarda and uh, Pino Ferronato in Padova to really complement my skills, my knowledge, my career. Because uh, I will invite everyone to really attend to a TMJ surgery. Because uh, if you see a TMJ live, immediately you should do what Gunnar Carson did. Articulators. <laughs> That's the most uh, 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 frozen shower experience I've had, in, or one of the most frozen shower experiences I've had in my life. I remember uh, uh, that during the first, very first presence in my, of my career in Padua, in the surgical room, I went there as a young uh, dentist, uh, they, they wanted to know my feelings as uh, TMD experts and uh, the first thing Professor Ferronato 
he passed away a couple of days ago, told me is, oh, a tattoo doctor, <laughs> I don't agree. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and I, uh, oh, professor, uh, there are the names of my kids. Uh, 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 <laughs> and the second thing he told me, I asked, oh, nice, what's the function there? And he told me, together with Luca Guarda, now there's an indication. Fashion there, one millimeter left, <laughs> turn right, <laughs> and, and you will avoid to, to destroy. Okay, real life is different from textbooks. How many of you have been really, uh, um, have ever even seen a TMJ story? Okay, only a three of them, open of, surgery. of course. Open, open surgery. surgery. Open surgery. So, for you, okay, and if you, what was your feeling? That prior to the surgery, we did an MRI of the patient, and we realized after opening, during the surgery, that the MRI is very different from what we actually see in the surgery. Yeah, uh, okay. the, the MRI is not different. The MRI simply categorized the yeah. tissues in a way that enables you to, to see and to focus on certain uh, tissues. But when you go there, there are not empty spaces, there are not a difference right. between the disc and the surrounding tissues. Uh, uh, and it's a map. The, it's like a map. The MRI is a map. Uh, the MRI is a map. Yeah. Yeah. No, the MRI is a signal. Yeah. Exactly. It's a signal. It might even be more complex because some kind of tissues like, for instance, a little bit more like a fibrous disc can be very difficultly discriminated from the attachment of the yeah. muscle and things like that. So we should consider it as a signal. It's a magnetic signal which gives us a map. Right? Yeah. And especially with regard to surgery, when you watch it and you compare it with MRI, of course you should also realize that before you can go into surgery, there is full sedation anesthesia. Yeah. So everything with regard to muscle is also completely different yeah. than the time that you took the MRI. So it might well be that whatever kind of position of yeah. the disc you're watching can be completely different. Our surgeons usually say, this is not what we see in yeah. surgery, much less, much less this positioning, this placement, close clock, than you see clinically. And it might be partly due to the fact that in the relaxation, of course, yeah. you have completely different... Uh, I remember our patient, uh, very tough experience. I remember of a patient uh, uh, with a clinical and computerized tomography diagnosis of ankylosis. We were not able to get her open the mouth, yeah. and in the end, uh, uh, plan for surgery. After the general anesthesia, we went there just to. Uh, realize if we were able to even open the mouth for some millimeter just to understand how to position the mandible after that we went there and oh, what to do we have booked the, the surgical room for the entire morning uh, 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 synthesis in the the, the the surgical room safest choice to do Okay. But in the end, the power of muscles cannot be underestimated. And the power of muscles doesn't depend on the position of your premolar. They become crazy <laughs> with these issues about neatologies and the stiffness of the coast. Especially if you consider that most of the time, uh, patients uh, uh, keep the jaw muscles tense without keeping the teeth in contact. Because when you got the teeth contact, of course it's a bad habit, but the, 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 there is a, a sort of a protective reaction and the brain says, hey, 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 you're destroying the teeth, okay? Relax a bit. So, if you think about what you are doing now, I'm sure that some of you are keeping the muscles tense without the teeth in contact. Maybe with the tongue uh, in between or even simply keeping the muscles tense. 
that's the TMD camp or the Manfredini course. Overload of the muscles done in this way. And we got an entire week to fix this concept. But if you understand this concept, one patient, the very first patient of this afternoon, is enough. Because all the others are variation of the theme. They may have differently naive story, uh, they may have different uh, TMJ imaging. If you are uh, uh, an expert, let me say, of course, uh, sometimes you, uh, you have very tough patient with chronic pain or with tumors or uh, neurologists and so on, but they have nothing to do with the temporomandibular joint disorder. Because the TMD symptoms are a sign of overload on this joint. So, to enter anatomy, there's a, a, an inverse L cap just to avoid the, the fascial nerve. Then you can enter the capsule. You have to wash the, the capsule just to uh, distend the tissues and to see to gain uh, space for your surgery. And this is the disc. Okay? And for my experience, uh, I don't have statistics. I love statistics, but I don't have this kind of statistics. But <laughs> at hand, uh, I can say that during the very first years of my tenure in Padova, Luca and Professor Fernando uh, uh, operated, I guess, 50 or 60 or maybe even 80 uh, patients for temporomandibular disorders. With my uh, uh, lessons, lectures, teachings, uh, even those two guys who are the two best maxillofacial surgeons in Italy for the TMJ, reduce the number of interventions to three or four per year. Fractures excluded, of course. Because the only true indication are ankylosis and super severe arthrosis uh, just to uh, uh, try to do something. Of course, we have the option of uh, uh, positioning uh, TMJ prosthesis. Okay? But the indications for surgery, just because of what we know about the relationship between anatomy and uh, function and symptoms, has been progressively reduced. Okay? So, again, sometimes you create space. This is uh, a human uh, uh, amniotic membrane. Okay? Position to uh, replace the disc because when you get the disc out, if you close the the the, 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 the cap and, and uh, finish your intervention without putting anything in between the, the two joint surfaces, what's going to happen? Ankylization, because you are provoking an hematro. Okay? And you can see a martro even uh, uh, after the positioning of TMJ prosthesis if you don't put anything in between. And you know why many pure people with knee prosthesis or hip prosthesis have such difficulties to move around or to gain uh, some sort of lateral flexibility because they got secondary ankylosis around the, their, uh, their prosthesis. Of course, if you consider the time that is needed to uh, 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 generate this secondary ankylosis and the time that on average uh, the, the, the prosthesis of the knee are positioned. Uh, I, 
I guess we, we could accept it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but in theory, some material should be placed in between the joint surfaces, also in the knee and in the hip and shoulders and so on. Okay, then? The, 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 the surgical sketches are positioned by strata and there are really no exitus, no scars because the, the entrance cap is named along the preliminary foil. Okay? This was the old disc repositioning technique. So take the disc and fix it with mini screws uh, uh, forcing it uh, against the condyle by trespassing also the, the joint capsule. Uh, a nonsense intervention? Yeah. Uh, of course relaxing because as soon as the capsule is trapped and it may happen when, uh, with this forced minuscule uh, position, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the disposition will uh, relapse forward. Okay? This is another technique. Uh, fat tissues from the abdomen, so twofold aims, liposuction. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, uh, there's covering and replacement of the, the disc. Okay. This is a technique mediated by a very nice uh, Australian surgeon, George Levichuris, who was the inventor. Okay. But this, it is just to show you something. So, uh, I guess we can. Uh, stop the live and send our best wishes to all the audience. We could stay together again on Thursday for a brief treatment, uh, for a brief live on some treatment topics, okay, just to show uh, what we are discussing.